excited to be here and share some of the things that I've been working on recently. So it wasn't until last year or so that I realized how important video analysis has become these days. Most teams now have not just one video analyst, but entire teams of them who are carefully scrutinizing match footage week in, week out, trying to get an edge. Now, it makes sense why video analysis is, is at the center of a lot of analysis. Video is easily digestible. We all understand it. It's intuitive. And if you back up your insights with video evidence, people are just more likely to believe it and act on it. The cost of this thorough analysis, though, is that it's quite time consuming and laborious. And so the, the question that I became quite interested in last year is, how can we help accelerate video analysis? Is there anything that we can do from the data side to help analysts do their job uh, quicker, more thoroughly, get even more insights? And so we have this well-established process at all clubs today. Video footage is, is scrutinized by video analysts who draw insights from it. And in recent years, as tracking data has become more and more common, people have developed algorithms to do similar things directly from tracking data. But these two approaches to the same problem have more or less developed in isolation. They haven't really interacted all that much. And so the hypothesis here is that if we can make a conscious effort to try and bridge that gap, uh, maybe we can try and uh, leverage the best of both worlds here. And to be more specific, I think both of these things have their own unique contributions. Analysts have domain expertise. They've studied the sport for many, many years, and they know exactly what insights matter, how to communicate them. And on the other hand, algorithms have the distinct benefit of scale. So they don't have to literally watch 90 minutes of a match. They can process a match in a few seconds. And so the purpose of this project then became to build tools that help us leverage both of these things, the analyst expertise, but at scale. Now in this presentation, we'll be going through three basic tools that I think will be great additions to the analyst toolkit. The first one is called situation search. Now, very often, an analyst sees something interesting happening on the pitch. They want to dive deeper. They want to find all the times where it happened, compile these clips, and then show it to coaches, maybe even players, discuss it with other analysts. And so situation search will help them do exactly that. A lot of manual tagging and coding is still done on video footage today by analysts. Very time consuming. And I think there's some space here if the analyst can teach an algorithm what a counterattack looks like, for example, or what a crossing opportunity looks like. Then if the algorithm can pick up on that and detect those automatically, then it can go off and tag matches that the video analyst hasn't got the time to see. And lastly, a lot of analyst work is in understanding team styles, strengths, weaknesses, defending, uh, attacking, and transitions between those two phases. But they're often restricted by the number of matches that they can watch. So you only have a few days to prepare for the next match. You can only watch the last five matches of the opposition. I think there's some space here if algorithms can look beyond the five matches and surface insights that the analyst may not have seen. And so to figure out how we can build these tools to help analysts, almost like an assistant to the analyst, let's first try and figure out what makes analysts so great. How do they think about these different problems? So I did a little experiment on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. I put out this raw frame of tracking data. It's just the positions, a static image. It's not from a particular match. I just dragged these positions into place and created this frame. And I asked a purposely vague question. I asked, how would you describe this frame as an analyst? So I got about 35 responses. And thank you to everyone who contributed to it. And there were some key observations in, in different buckets. So the first bucket of observations was about the defending team. So people were able to pick out that they're in a 5-3-2 a very compact, narrow, uh, organized mid-block. They're not putting any pressure on the ball. Some were concerned that their defensive line might be a little too high, so they might be susceptible to a ball in behind the back. But overall, people said that they are in control of the situation. For the attacking team, people said that they lack attacking intent. The organization in midfield especially is quite poor. Uh, the man on the ball does not really have any good passing options. But if they were to consider next actions, they could try switching play to the left, where there might be an overload. They could try playing the midfield runner or the striker in behind if it's matched with a good run. Or as a fallback, they can just recirculate possession through defense again. The third set of observations I wasn't quite expecting going into this, but I got at least four people asking me, is this Liverpool? Because it looks like <laughs> Alexander Arnold is about to switch play to Mane or Robertson on the left. But the, the key takeaway here is that just by looking at a particular game situation, even just a static frame, analysts are really good at producing these insightful summaries. They can break down the attacking team shape, defending team shape, what they should do next. 
uh, and also relate them to things they've seen uh, last weekend, for example. And so inspired by this ability of analysts to produce these summaries, maybe we can build a system that has some of this capability as well. And we're never going to be as good as analysts. Analysts have the domain expertise. But if we can even build something that's minutely as good as them, then maybe we can start to leverage the scale of algorithms to bring utility to analysts. So if we can do this, we can potentially unlock the applications that we mentioned earlier. How do we go about? Uh, getting these insightful summaries. So imagine this fictional game where I'm going to show you an image of a face. It can be anyone, but in this case, it's someone we all recognize. And your job as a player of this game is to come up with a summary no longer than 10 words of this person's face. I'm going to take the summary that you give me to a sketch artist, and they are going to try and draw what they think the original face was. right? So your job is to really come up with the best 10 words. And because it's only 10 words, you're going to have to think long and hard about how you use those 10 words. And so this thing in the middle, the, the fact that you can only use 10 words, this constraint is often called an information bottleneck. And what it helps us do is extract only the most relevant information and discard things that are not as relevant. Now, when you first attempt to play this game, you might not be great at producing summaries. You might not be capturing what's actually important. And the sketch artist might produce something like this. <laughs> but as you play this game more and more, you'll start to learn what makes a good summary. And so the important part about this framework is that at the end of the day, when you play this many, many times over, you'll become really good at producing these face summaries. Now, this is exactly how systems like face recognition are built. Uh, it's not people, of course, behind the scenes. But algorithms learn how to look at a face and produce these concise summaries. And then if you see multiple images that have the same face summary, they likely belong to the same person. So this, this ability to look at some complex input and then produce a summary is actually quite important. It unlocks a lot of applications. So now we're not interested in searching for faces. We're interested in searching for game situations. So but we can use the exact same framework for this. We're going to create another fictional game. This time it's going to be played by a machine and, and not by us. So we have as input not a face, but a raw tracking frame. Again, we're going to ask the machine to come up with a summary. This time, it's made up of numbers and not words, because machines speak in numbers. And now we're going to ask the machine to come up with the best summary possible so that the summary alone can be used to produce the Voronoi diagram of the original frame. Now, Voronoi diagrams have their root in math. They've been used in sports more recently. And essentially, what they're doing is coloring each point on the pitch, either orange or blue, based on uh, which player is the closest. So they tell us something about space control and occupation that's definitely valuable. Now, if you strip away the bells and whistles from the traditional Voronoi diagram, this is what it looks like to a machine. It's just a bunch of orange and blue zones. And you'll notice that something very important is missing here. We can't quite tell where the ball is by looking at the traditional Voronoi. So we're going to make one modification. We're going to add a third color for the region controlled by the ball. And that's up in gray over there. And another deficiency of traditional Voronoi diagrams is that they're very binary. They have to make this decision if a point is controlled by orange or blue or gray. But in truth, space control and occupation is much more fluid and continuous, and we should allow for that. So we're going to make a second modification. Instead of looking at just who's the closest, we're going to look at how close are the different players around a region. And we're going to color it, for example, 60% orange or 40% blue, and, and allow for mixes like that. And we're going to call this a, a soft Voronoi. It's sort of a, a smooth Voronoi diagram. So now we have this, this game set up, and we're going to make this machine play it. Uh, in particular, we're going to use a deep learning setup. And the reason to do this is that in other domains, especially computer vision, natural language processing, deep learning setups have been really, really successful at learning these intermediate representations or summaries. And, and they're just state-of-the-art techniques. And so we try to do the same thing here with tracking frames. Now, again, what's really important at the end of the day is not the prediction of the soft Voronoi, but the summary that it helps us learn. So this ability now that we have to look at a tracking frame and produce a summary of 32 numbers is really powerful. And then we can start to build on this. Now, if you zoom out a little, you'll notice that all we had to do over here was provide the system a bunch of tracking frames. We showed it an entire league season worth of tracking frames, and it's doing the rest. We're not providing any human annotations or labels that are telling it to classify the frames as something or anything like that. It's literally just watching them, and it's learning how it can best summarize different frames. 
So this regime is often called self-supervision in machine learning. So we're not actually providing external supervision. The system is learning to supervise itself by looking at different properties of the data. So hopefully the, the title of the talk makes a little bit more sense now. There's another way to view this, this ability now to produce summaries. So we can take a tracking frame, we can turn it into 32 numbers, and you can think of 32 numbers as a vector or a point in 32 dimensions. Now, we can't visualize 32 dimensions as humans, but we can squish this down to three dimensions uh, using dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA. And now, this is what we get if we take every single tracking frame from an entire season and project it down into 3D. So it's roughly spherical. You can see all of these single points are individual tracking frames. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that there's one face of this sphere that's open. It's sort of like a bowl shape. And there's a reason behind this. I can, uh, I can tell you more about that offline. Um, so now, with this foundation, we can start to build all the different applications that we promised. So situation search. When we want to do situation search, what we can do is take the tracking frame, find where it lives in this, this sphere, in this 32-dimensional space, and we can just look for its nearest neighbors. The nearest neighbors are frames that have similar summaries and therefore are likely to be similar situations. So it's literally just ne nearest neighbor search in 32 dimensions. So we can look at how, uh, what it actually does when you look at video. So imagine you're watching this match as an analyst. You see that the blue team often does this thing where they take the ball to the right byline and they try to get the red team in this 2v2 situation. And they're doing it a couple of times. You want to look further into it. So you pause the video over here. And under the hood, the system is going to search for all the similar situations. And it's going to show you this timeline, the similarity timeline. So the hot spots, the really bright spots on this timeline indicate instances in the match where something very similar happened. So as a video analyst, you're watching this video, you can immediately skip to the other bright spots. So here's the first example, particularly bright spot in the 56 minute. We can see what happens over here. They start a little bit further back from midfield and again find themselves in this 2v2. This time they play the winger in behind, tries to go around the outside, doesn't make much of it. We can look at what happens in the 67th minute. So this time it's a long ball from defense. But again, they're in that similar 2v2 now. And this time there's a midfield runner who gets played in, and they actually end up scoring of the rebound. We can look at this instance in the 37th minute. Now this one is interesting because on the timeline it's not that bright, but it is over a long period of time. So what this tells us is that it's not exactly what we're looking for. It might not be a 2v2. But it's something similar that happened for a good 20 or 30 seconds. And if you look at the video, it's more of a 3v3 situation, and they're trying to find a way through. Uh, eventually, they, they twist and turn, and they end up getting a corner out of it in a couple of seconds. Right, so you can use this kind of interface if you're watching video to immediately pause and find similar instances. You can compile clips of entire situations that happen over a match. And there's actually nothing constraining us to a single match. We can do this over multiple matches. And it might be really useful to do this to study how did players make different decisions in different games given the same situation. All right, so you're not always watching video. Sometimes you have a particular situation in mind and you just want to search for that. And so to do that, you can also have this kind of tactic board interface where you're just dragging around different players. And as you do so, the similarity timeline is updating in real time. So here I want to study specifically the distribution of the goalkeeper when the players were clustered to their left. And so I can do exactly that, click on the bright spots, find when it occurred in the match, and then I can skip to the video to compile those clips. And I can also switch sides uh, pretty easily, study the same thing for the opposing goalkeeper. So these are just two different ways to do situation search. You can either start from video and find other video, or you can start from a tactic board and find video as well. Right. So we can talk about auto-tagging now. So auto-tagging is going to work in two stages. The first stage is going to involve the analyst teaching the system what to look for. So the first example we have is if you want to auto-tag crossing opportunity. It's kind of vague. But when we see a good crossing opportunity, we, really, we, can, we can say that, yes, it's a good one. It's hard to come up with rules for it, though. So this is a, a good candidate to build an auto tagger for. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to this interface, and I have to provide the system some examples of what are and what are not crossing opportunities. So this one isn't, but I'm going to drag the players into 
something that is a good crossing opportunity. I'm going to hit the positive button. And as soon as I do that, the system is going to start asking me a bunch of questions. It's asking me, is this a crossing opportunity? What about this one? What about this one? And it's going to, going to do that again and again. And as we answer these questions, it's becoming incrementally better each time. And if we do this for a little bit, this one is kind of sped up. But if you do this for about uh, 20 examples, you actually start to see on the top right, the frames that are highest scoring, that are auto-tagged, are all indeed good crossing opportunities. So if you want some more confidence in this, you can do it for a little bit longer. In this case, it takes about 50 labels, a total of three minutes of the analyst time to build a reasonably good crossing opportunity auto tagger. So now when we have this, we can actually start to tag matches at scale. We can take our auto tagger to every single frame of a particular match, and we can compute a crossing opportunity score for that. So this is what it looks like. Ball gets played out wide, the auto tagger starts to trigger. They cut in, it drops a little bit, and then they play it back out, back up again, and eventually they get the cross away. Here's another example. They build down the right this time. Not triggering yet, because there's no one in the box to cross it to. But at this point, they will switch it over to the left, and they find a lot of space, at which point uh, there's also some runners in the box, and it starts to auto-tag uh, this situation as a crossing opportunity. And if you do this for every single frame in a match, you can produce a crossing opportunity timeline. So again, the bright spots tell you instances where crossing opportunities might have occurred. You can do this for something slightly more complex. Counterattacks are a little bit more ambiguous. Um, and so if we're going to follow the same process. This one is, is sped up throughout. So you'll see I'm arranging these situations that look like counterattacks to teach the system this is what you need to look for. This one takes a little bit longer because it is slightly more nuanced. It takes about five minutes, a total of 80 labels from the analyst end. And this is the output. So blue team is attacking over here. They lose the ball to the orange team. And they are now in sort of a, a three or four v five situation, at which point it starts to auto tag it as a counter attack. They fumble a bit over here. The defense reorganizes, and it drops back down. Here's another example. They're starting from a corner, the blue team again. Orange in a, actually a very strong 3v3 counterattack here. And just about when they cross the halfway line, it really starts to trigger and goes up to 95%. They, they do end up scoring on this one. Now, I do want to give you a complete picture. There are some cases where it fails. So here, the blue team plays the ball across. They lose the ball. Orange plays it back to their goalkeeper, who just punts it out and, and clears it high up into the air. Now, the reason it, it auto-tags this as a counter-attack is because our system didn't really take into account velocities. It doesn't take into account that the ball is moving. Um, and also, it doesn't take into account ball height. So if you take a snapshot just about here, it looks like that blue striker might be onto the ball. But in truth, uh, the goalkeeper just cleared it high up into the air. So that's, that's the next step, incorporating velocities um, and also the ball height. But until then, false positives exist. But on the bright side, at least we have this short list of instances to look at. So the analyst now has to not look through all 90 minutes, but maybe just the list of candidate counterattacks and just verify if they're right or not. And what's happening under the hood is that the auto tagger is trying to figure out in this 32-dimensional space which frames are and are not crossing opportunities, for example. So the red ones it thinks are, and the blue ones it thinks are not. And so this is just a binary classification problem. We can use any binary classifier for this. In this case, we use logistic regression. And the important part is we do it directly on this 32-dimensional summary space. Right. So we can talk about team fingerprints now. And team fingerprints are all about understanding how a particular team plays, where their strengths and weaknesses are. We've seen this a few times now. These are all the tracking frames for an entire league season. But the interesting thing is, if you filter these out by team, so you only look at the tracking frames recorded by team X, you get something that looks more like this. So you can see that some areas on this figure are more dense for them, some are sparse. And this, in that sense, is their fingerprint on the league. They prefer certain situations. They don't like other certain situations. And so team fingerprints are all about studying the distribution of team X in that 32-dimensional space. We can start to ask some pretty interesting questions out of that. So as artists, we can ask, 
What does the team do unusually often? What's something that, when you look at the league average, they're just doing way more, way more often than that? So starting from a team, we want to find the situations that they're finding themselves in very often. Here's an example of, uh, of team A over here. So the first two top scoring frames show them building out the back with a slight preference to the right hand side. The next two frames also show them uh, building out the back, but they're being pressed pretty high up the pitch by their opponents. And the next two actually show what look to be counterattacks with blue team. Now, this is by no means definitive, but it's a good starting point for something to look into. So by looking at these different frames, we can piece together that this team, team A, likes to build out the back with a preference to the right, but if they're pressed high up the pitch, which they are often, then they might be susceptible to counterattacks. But we should look at video to, to definitely verify this, but this is a, an example of the kinds of insights that uh, this data might be able to tell analysts uh, to look for in, in video and verify. We can look at another one. Here's Team B's fingerprints. So four of their top six situations are them taking corners from, from either side. Definitely something to look into when you're analyzing them. And another one here shows them celebrating together. And it turns out they are one of the top scorers in the league. Um, so it's interesting that it picks out on that. All right. So we can ask a second question, very related to that. But analysts are usually preparing for a match. They have not just one team in mind, but two teams. So a match is played between team A and team B. We can start to ask, how do these two fingerprints uh, match up against each other? Are there certain situations that we're highly likely to see when they match up? So here's an example. All four of these uh, top scoring frames show team A building down the left-hand side. And what's important here is not just the fact that team A likes to build down the left, but this tells us that team B in their past matches has tended to defend down the right as well. And so it, there's a compatibility here in that Team A will look to attack on the left unusually often, but also maybe there's a weakness on, on Team B's right-hand side of defense. So when you watch their match, you, you shouldn't be surprised if you see things like this happening. We can also ask the inverse of this question, which is, what are some situations that are incompatible? So these are things that Team A does very often, but Team B doesn't find themselves on the receiving end of that very often. So here we see all three of these frames show Team A attacking very centrally down the middle. It's a, quite a congested midfield. And this tells us that Team B in their prior matches hasn't allowed opposition to do that. So maybe they're congesting the midfield or they're forcing their opponents out wide. So if you're Team A, you might want to look for alternative strategies and, and dig deeper. Right, so we can talk about next steps. So I think there's, there's two big buckets that next steps are, are divided into. The first set of uh, improvements is around improving the core representation. So we talked about a couple of these things already. We need to incorporate velocities and also the ball height. Those are just two very important things, and otherwise our, our representation is quite incomplete. This will help reduce some of the false positive issues that we saw. And also, like we saw in the previous presentation, there's some more subtle concepts like zonal marking versus man-to-man -man marking. Those are very fine-grained concepts. And the current system over here doesn't quite capture that level of detail. And so we could do some work over there to actually capture specific uh, positions in a very close radius as well. As far as practical considerations go, there's a, there's a couple of improvements that we made. So right now, our whole system depends on the fact that each frame has 23 sets of x, y positions. So 11 for team A, 11 for team B, and then the position of the ball. If any one of these are missing, then it just doesn't work. It, and so we need to be able to handle that. There's a couple of reasons to do that. Firstly, what if a team gets a red card? We just won't be able to process the rest of the match. That's one. But second, also, as, as tracking data starts to be derived from broadcast footage directly, uh, we might have situations where we only know of the positions of some subset of players and not all of them all the time. And secondly, it'd be great if we can do focused queries. And what this means is that you might want to look for situations where your right back is high up the pitch in an, in an advanced position. But you don't necessarily care about where everyone else is. Whereas right now, in our situation search tool, uh, you have to specify where everyone else is, and search is based on that. So it'd be good if we can specify, I only really care about these players or this area of the pitch, and find me situations that were similar in that area. Right, so thank you to David Steele for providing a lot of great feedback on this presentation, and thank you all for listening. Thank you.